The end is in sight for the U.S. combat mission in Iraq. Troops are expected to shift to an advisory role by the end of the year. President Biden met with Iraq's prime minister on Monday to announce troops will no longer serve in a combat capacity. The move to shift troops comes at the request of the Iraqi government. There are about 2,500 U.S. troops in Iraq who are focused on training and support. Joining me to talk more about this is retired U.S. Army major and military analyst Mike Lyons. Welcome, Mike. Great to see you. So this won't be a withdrawal like the one we saw in Afghanistan, correct? Can you explain the support role the Biden administration is promising here and what it means for U.S. troops? Well, the mission is going to transfer. It's going to go from right now. It really isn't even a combat mission right now. We have soldiers there in uniform, but it's going to go to a training and mission of intelligence collection there as the question remains as to whether ISIS 2.0 can come back in Iraq and create counterinsurgency missions and create things for that government there. I think this is a real win for the Iraqi government, for uh, the prime minister, al Kadimi. I think that uh, his constituency wants American troops off the soil. That's the way it works in that part of the world. They don't they look at them as infidels that are there. So I think you'll see more contractors there. But but in some ways, from our side, mostly symbolic, 2,500 troops. The last administration wanted them out as well. But the dirty little secret is we don't know how many troops are still in the western part of Iraq that are fighting ISIS, those special operators. There's likely anywhere from 250 to 500 troops there. So there's still I wouldn't be surprised if they stay inside of Syria and we still see troops uh, have a footprint there as well. And what do Iraqi leaders gain politically by having the U.S. end its combat mission? Like you said, it's not really a combat mission anymore, but but still, why this timing? Well, the political situation inside Iraq is more stable, uh, something that it wasn't four or five years ago now. And this will appease uh, constituency within the Iraqi government that still has a tremendous influence uh, from Iran, as Iran's uh, Shia militia groups are well threaded within the Iraqi security forces. It's almost similar to how Russia influences the Ukraine as it controls, you know, from the outside. Iran does the same thing in Iraq. Now, this likely will give a little bit more power back to the prime minister inside of Iraq to gain, um, you know, to try to put more of an arm's length between him and what's going on in Iran. Um, the question is, the Iranians are going to let this clock play out and just see how long it goes as they continue to have that influence because of their Shia militia groups that are part of the security forces already. So who are the actors then that see the presence of U.S. troops in Iraq as the most problematic? And will this shift to an advisory role sort of help settle those concerns? You know, again, the Iranian government's going to be welcome this. Uh, you'll look at groups for like ISIS, for example, who have been focused on what I'll call ungoverned spaces. They've been more focused out west in Africa and in Syria and that civil war there. So I don't see you're going to see ISIS 2.0. I, I do think that overall for both sides, both for President Biden here in the country, I, I think you'll you'll see uh, a lot of support for this. And, and like like we did in Afghanistan, we'll likely be out of there well before the end of the year. But if this can stabilize the Iraqi government and as they push forward to try to have uh, you know some semblance of, of order there, uh, keep the counterinsurgency mission up, maintain places like Mosul and, and maintain Basra and, and all of these outlying areas that are, that are away from the flagpole, away from Baghdad, have been a problematic before. I, I think that um, that overall you'll see a, a strengthened prime minister there and, and a better country going forward within the region. And not to you know compare them too directly, but this is the second move to end a combat mission we've seen since President Biden took office. Um, is, does this tell you something about the way his administration plans to approach sort of military action overseas? Do you expect we'll see more of this? Um, where else do you think officials are considering removing American troops? Tanya, I think this is a little different than Afghanistan. I think this is really more symbolic. Afghanistan had uh, a much more uh, combat mission there. Um, this is all about ending these endless wars that the, the president said he wanted to do. So I think that's good. I think, though, as you look around the landscape, you're going to see a greater pivot to the Pacific. You're going to see much more focus on our Navy. I don't think we're moving troops out of Japan or the Pacific Rim anytime soon. In fact, we might reinforce some in Australia and other places like that. 
And we'll keep an eye on uh, Eastern Europe as well with Russia that's there. But I think I think this is just, you know, again, more symbolic as we pivot towards mm -hmm. where we perceive to be a great power conflict that can that can exist over Taiwan, for example. I think there was just a war fighting exercise that took place there that showed we've got some work to do if we're going to defend um, Taiwan and the situation that's happening in the South China Sea. Absolutely. And, and what about the Baltic Sea? Do you think there might be uh, some sort of more naval action there as well? You know, that's a great point. I think that that is a lose-lose for us. We get into it. We get kind of sucked into that area, that part of the world, uh, and our Navy can get trapped. There's there's uh, tactical issues there, as, as I've learned from that situation there. So I don't see us necessarily focusing on that. And I think, in fact, if we start to become more of an antagonist to Russia and that part of the world, um, we can't have admission to NATO to be everybody but Russia. I think that, that creates the same kind of condition that started World War I, you know, 100 years ago with these entanglements and alliances. So uh, we've got to make sure right. that we, we don't necessarily project power in those places where it's clearly a home game for those, uh, play, you know, the Russians and the, and the Russian Navy that, that are in those places already. Great points. All right. Well, Mike Lyons, thank you so much for joining us. We always appreciate your expertise. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for having me.